Praise be to Jesus Christ. Welcome to Catholic Drive Time. This is your producer, Adrian Fonseca. And today we're going to be talking about the book, uh, The Once and Future Roman Rite by Dr. Peter Kwasniewski. And hopefully I said his name right. Uh, I know that's a perpetual problem he has with everybody uh, pronouncing it a totally different way, but we'll, hopefully we'll be at least consistent. So today we're going to be talking about the book, The Once and Future Roman Rite, Returning to the Traditional Latin Liturgy After 70 Years of Exile. And I haven't yet finished the book. It's a giant tome. I feel like every time I'm like halfway through one of Dr. Peter's books, there's another one that comes out. Uh, so the it's, it's quite quite prolific. But I was halfway through with it, and I was just, this, this is such a amazing tome. I, I cannot recommend it enough. But uh, Dr. Peter is with us today. Good morning to you, Dr. Peter. Good morning. Good morning. Praise be to God. So today, I know I, there's a lot of places that we could start, but I feel like the best place to start is from the beginning. In, the, in this top, you talked about tradition, and everybody has heard the word tradition, and if people think of it in different ways. But you distinguish four kinds of tradition, and it's kind of weight. Could you talk about uh, what we mean when we say tradition, and, and what are the categories that you were breaking it down into? Certainly. Yes, very good question, and, in, and, and a very fundamental question. Um, so the word tradition comes from the Greek word paradosis, which is Latinized into traditio, and it just means the the handing down or that which is handed down. Um, so it's, it's, it's actually quite a concrete image of one person, you might say, handing over a deposit, uh, something treasured to another person who's going to then keep it for him and hand it down to somebody else as well. So an inheritance, um, a transmission of a deposit. Uh, and of course, right away, then we have to say there are different sorts of 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 um, deposits uh, or or inheritances that the church has. She has what we call the deposit of faith. That is uh, what is divinely revealed, what is given to us by God Himself, uh, and especially by our Lord Jesus Christ. Um, and that is tradition with a capital T. That's the tradition that we say is 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 one of the two forms of revelation, scripture and tradition is, is a common phrase that you'll hear. Um, and that is divine and it's unchangeable, it's immutable, right? It would include um, uh, really just about everything that we profess in the creed that we, that we uh, pray together. But then you have uh, apostolic tradition um, and that the theologians divide that into, um, into uh, different types. We don't need to necessarily get into that. But apostolic tradition is what the apostles themselves instituted um, in the name of uh, Christ and after Christ. And then finally, you have what's called ecclesiastical tradition. Um, and ecclesiastical tradition is really everything else that the church has devised, has added uh, in the form of prayer, in the form of art, culture, architecture, um, theological exposition and and development. Um, the church, of course, for 2,000 years has been pondering, like Mary in her heart, all that Christ gave her and has elaborated it in very helpful and beautiful ways. And so this whole body of ecclesiastical tradition is also something handed down and something very, very valuable that we should not um, hold lightly. Absolutely. And, you know, I was really struck like right at the very beginning of the book. And it just reminded me because, you know, we keep up with things going on in the Vatican and, and Pope Francis was talking about this uh, this unknown saint to me. I had never heard of him, uh, Saint Vincent Lorenz. And all of a sudden I was like, oh, I've never heard of this saint. I wanted to, to thank the Holy Father for bringing up this, uh, this great Holy uh, Church Father. And in the book you quote him, you say, keep the deposit. What is the deposit? That which has been entrusted to you, not that which you have yourself devised, a matter not of cleverness, but of learning, not of private adoption, but a public tradition, a matter brought to you, not put forth by you, wherein you are bound to be not an author, but a keeper, not a teacher, but a disciple, not a leader, but a follower. Keep the deposit, preserve the talents of the Catholic faith, inviolate, unadulterate, that which has been entrusted to you. Let it continue in your possession. Let it be handed on by you. You have received gold. Give gold in turn. Do not substitute one thing for another. Do not for gold impudently substitute lead or brass. Give real gold, not counterfeit. And that struck me because that's in 400 and they're already talking about 
issues of people wanting to corrupt traditions. And I guess it happened in our Lord's life, too, saying uh, rejecting the traditions of man for instead hold fast to the traditions of God. Um, yes. What are your thoughts about that passage? Like that was so striking yes. to me. So St. Vincent of Lorenz is one of the greatest church fathers, one of the most important for Catholics to know. He's not great in the sense of Augustine. He didn't write a lot. He didn't leave a huge body of work talking about every doctrine and every heresy. But he left a very precious treatise called the Commonatorium. Uh, basically, it just means a sort of memory aid uh, in which St. Vincent says, I'm going to write down for you now basically how the Catholic faith is to be understood, how we know what is the content of the Catholic faith, what we are to believe and what we are to do. Um, it's a, Again, it's one of these very basic questions that all of us ask ourselves, especially in a time of confusion like the present. Um, and so then St. Vincent lays out uh, a bunch of what he calls uh, rules uh, for, under, for, for knowing what is the Catholic faith. And he says, for example, we have to look to what is ancient. We have to look to what is commonly received by everyone. We need to look at, um, you know, what is internally coherent at the teaching of councils and popes. So he, he lays out these basic rules, which have become norms for all theological discourse afterwards. Um, but the thing that's really wonderful about Vincent is he is passionate about tradition, about doing what has been done before, uh, and believing what has been handed down by those who came before us. He's absolutely against novelty. That's his big sort of punching bag. Is He's constantly uh, striking against novelty and innovation. Um, and and he, he helpfully distinguishes for us between uh, what you might call um, organic developments, things that, that uh, really are growths of a plant to a mature form. So it's the same plant or the same person, the same animal, but now in a more mature form, like an adult versus a, a child. Uh, and, and then things that are sheer innovation, that is, they never were taught before, they never existed before, uh, they're, they're just something else entirely. Um, and, and this is the, you know, the somewhat unfortunate part about Pope Francis's invocations of St. Vincent of Lorenz is that uh, he often invokes him when when he's saying the opposite of what <laughs> Vincent is saying. You know, uh, so, so Francis will say, for example, uh, you know, as St. Vincent of Lorenz says, we should have development. And that's why I'm saying now that the death penalty is no longer admissible. And you're, you're kind of left scratching your head because because the death penalty is precisely one of those things that's always been taught as legitimate for, for the for the entire history of of Judaism and Christianity, uh, and suddenly you have Francis invoking Vincent. I mean, this doesn't make any sense. Yeah, there's so many things there that, uh, that we could touch on: organic development, um, the idea of you know. It's interesting you mentioned uh, from since the Jews, because there's also a continuity with the Jewish faith and the Je Jewish temple worship and the traditional mass. But one thing that I want to uh, focus on is I have I have a great devotion to the Dominican spirituality, and I love St. Vincent Ferrer. And so I read a lot of his sermons that can be found online, and I was reading uh, his sermon on the Feast of Our Lady, and he, uh, in his sermon, he says, when you ask, how is it the proposed theme of today's gospel about the Virgin Mary, since it speaks only of the Blessed Mary Magdalene and Martha, therefore the text seems impertinent and improper today. And it struck me when I was reading that sermon that I was like, Oh, this is the this is kind of a mentality that he talks about because he's saying, no, you don't understand. The church chose these passages for a very specific reason. And don't think that you know better than the church as to say that these passages don't fit here. And he goes on to talk about how Martha and Mary perfectly uh, encapsulate the virtues of Our Lady, but them together, the active and the spiritual life. But most importantly, Martha chose the better, and meaning our Mary chose the, Mary better. Chose the better. Yeah, Mary yeah. chose the better, and the, that's the contemplative life. And he uses that as a springboard to talk about Our Lady in that, in that passage. But it struck me because right. I'm like, this is what we did with the liturgy. We said, well, I don't get why we have it like this, so let's just do mm -hmm. something else. Uh, what do you think yes. about that? Yeah, exactly. I mean, you know, there's some... Um... There's a famous convert to the Catholic faith, uh, a, a lady, she was Episcopalian, her name was Justine Ward. Um, she converted right after the turn of the 20th century, and she was famous for something called the Ward Method of teaching Gregorian chant to children. But I was just reading about her recently, and she she said, when somebody asked her, why did you convert to the Catholic faith? Uh, you know, did you did you fall in love with it? Were you attracted to it? And she said, actually, 
I wasn't really attracted to it emotionally. I was sort of dragged in kicking and screaming because I saw that I saw that that the the arguments, the the reasons for the faith were there. I had to accept them. Um, but she she makes this interesting point. She says um, that uh, there was almost nothing in the Catholic Church that I did not initially dislike because I did not understand it. Mm. But once I when, when I but by being patient and by by striving to understand and by striving to live the faith, I ended up falling in love with all of these things that I initially disliked. Um, and I, I think that's quite true about traditional Catholicism in general. There are many things in it, whether it's the fasting and abstinence rules, the prayers at mass, the teaching on heaven and hell, the four last things, um, you know, the teachings about sexual morality. These are difficult. These are often difficult teachings for fallen human beings and especially for modern people because they go against our liberalism. But if we're patient and if we allow our minds and hearts to be formed by the teaching and practice of the church, we end up discovering the immense riches and the immense wisdom in those teachings and practices. Um, and, and that, I think, is exactly the case with the traditional liturgy. You know, somebody initially goes to it and says, I can't hear what the priest is saying. He has his back turned to me. I, you know, what am I supposed to be doing for the next hour? I, I'm thrown upon myself. You know, the church isn't helping me. And, you know, there's, it's very tempting to want to complain this way. But no, no, no. Just, in a way, qu be quiet. <laughs> you know, just kneel. Just start to absorb. And as time goes on, you will understand. You will understand. And this is how, this is how it is for me. Uh, now I absolutely love everything about the traditional liturgy down to its last little detail, down to the last rubric and, and gesture of the priest. But it, it's taken me decades to see all of these things, right? And isn't that beautiful? It's like a gift that you get to open for your whole life and you never get to the end of it, you know? It's And, and then when in heaven, you have the eternal gift that you never get to the end of. So I think we, we have to be, we're so impatient, modern people, mm. you know, we want everything just instantly put on a platter in front of us, you know, and and that's 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 unreasonable, especially when we're dealing with the infinite eternal mystery of God. Amen. Amen. That that's uh, like I said, like every single time I feel like every single point could be talked to about for an hour. But the you know, one thing that struck me uh, what you're saying is, yeah, there's a lot of things in the mass that are very confusing to people when they first go. And uh, the one thing that's huge that people always bring up is the la Latin language. And the two things that I was thinking of while thinking about the the question of Latin, I have a friend who uh, was uh, goes to the Ordinariate because we're in Houston, so the cathedral's here in Houston, and he was saying how, you know, I like the beautiful liturgies, I love it, but I'd rather go to the Ordinariate because at least I know what they're saying. And that, that it kind of struck me because uh, there was two things. One is that John the 23rd, and you kind of mentioned uh, a little bit about John 23rd and Paul the VI, namely Paul the VI, about uh, a defender of tradition and and his idea <laughs> there. But John 23rd defended the use of Latin, the preservation of Latin, which kind of struck me. I didn't realize that was a thing, and I recently read his document on, on Latin language. But also, while I was on vacation, I went to a Byzantine liturgy, and but it was in English. And when I was there the whole time, the, the deacon pops out from the back, from the room screen, and he says, uh, he says, quiet, pay attention, and but in English. And it just sounded so jarring to me that it was so familiar, so normal, so mundane, but he's also dressed in a very traditional uh, outfit. And me and my brother look at each other and we like stifle laughter. And I, that's not to be disrespectful to their liturgy or anything like that. Just the fact that it struck me how odd it is to have these sacred mm -hmm. mysteries in the vernacular language. I, I want to get to your take on, yes. on that idea. Well, yeah. So one of, one of, one of the chapters in this book that we're talking about today, Once in Future Roman Right, uh, that I, that I actually think is particularly important nowadays is the chapter 10 called uh, Byzantine, Tridentine, Montinian, Two Brothers and a Stranger. Uh, and what I do in that chapter is I go through and I, I compare how the Eastern liturgies and the western traditional western liturgies match up in terms of all of their qualities and how none of those qualities are present in the novus ordo or they're present in a feeble and imperfect and variable and changeable and uh, optional way um and so one of the things i go into in that chapter is the question of language um it's a bit simplistic to say as people often do that the eastern liturgies are in the vernacular 
actually, in many cases, they're not. So in, in many, many cases, there are Eastern liturgies that have always been done in some kind of what we could call sacral or hieratic or ecclesiastical language. That is a language that's not spoken by the common man on the street and never has been. And that's, of course, true of the elevated Latin of the Roman rite. That was never the vulgar language, never. Um, I get into that in the book. Uh, but it, it, but also of, of um, ancient Greek, the, the Koine Greek that the Greek Orthodox liturgy is still prayed in, uh, and the, the church Slavonic that the Russian Orthodox use um, and uh, and there are many other cases I, I list. I give a whole list of examples. So it's true that in some places the Eastern liturgies are done in the vernacular, but that's not a universal rule and that's not a requirement on their part. Um, however, I think we just need to respect there are going to be differences in different traditions. Um, the Eastern Christians often seem comfortable doing their litur doing the liturgy in their vernacular, but if you look at the texts of the liturgy, they're very poetic and elaborate and symbolically saturated. They're, they're very rich texts. <clears throat> and so even when they're in the vernacular, <clears throat> you never get the impression that, that what you're doing is just something every day. Like this is something casual and something that the priest is improvising or that, you know, it's like the, the, the daily news. No, it's never like that. It's much more elevated and noble and dignified, even in the vernacular. And I think that's also what some people find in the Anglican ordinariate, right? There's a certain, eloquence that you find there. Um, but Latin is the language of the Western church. It has been for over 1,500 years now. And that's not something that's merely accidental. That's not just some sort of accident of history. And the church said, whoops, we've been doing this for 1,500 years. I guess now we need to, you know, we, we, we were a little bit late, but, you know, I guess we should do it in the vernacular. No, I mean, John the Twenty Third says, this was by divine providence, this use of the Latin language. And what it's what it's acquired over time is a kind of special, sacred, set apart, transcendent feel or atmosphere uh, to it. That once when you enter into the mass, you know you're 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 kneeling there in church, and you hear the priest say, uh, "In nomine Patris et Filii et Spiritus Sancti, Amen." Intro ibo ad altare dei. Right away, you're you you know that you're in the the worship zone, so to speak. Right. This is now we're doing something now for God. We're worshiping God and we're entering into it humbly and 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 with devotion. The, the language helps us to enter into the presence of God, even when we don't understand every single word of it. Or when we hear the Gregorian chant beginning, the intro at the, at the mass, it's the same kind of thing. It's like it, it makes a certain partition between everyday secular life, the profane, the profanum, that which is outside the temple, and and the life that that of, of worship that is looking towards heaven towards eternal life. These, these kinds of partitions are really important for us as, as animals, as beings of flesh and blood and, and soul and mind, right? We, we need to have these, these concrete manifestations of the differentness and the otherness of the divine in order for it to really be able to penetrate into our souls. Yeah, that's so much. Every time uh, there's so many different things you could pick up on. One thing that uh, I noticed that you had mentioned was the idea that some people would say things like, oh, well, you know, the church, like the East have been doing this and uh, this in some kind of pseudo vernacular. And so the West, we got to catch up. We're going to, we we've been behind the ball. And I saw this a lot with uh, the apologia for the, the mass of Paul VI, uh, the, the new mass and people saying uh, that, I guess it was with the, the resource Mont movement to say that let's go back to the sources. Let's go back to the way it was. So where, what is the distinction between a resource mont or maybe perhaps better better said a false antiquarianism and organic development or tradition <clears throat> yes exactly well i mean it's a complicated question but but an important one um so basically church history always shows you moments of resource mall if you mean by that term uh moments in which people say we need to rediscover our sources we need to go back to, we need to study the scripture more or better. We need to study the church fathers um, more or better. Uh, we need to discover other, you know, we, we need to rediscover what's been forgotten in the passage of time. And so every reform movement in the history of the church does have a certain, um, not antiquarianism, that's a deviation, but a kind of attention being paid 
to uh, the ancient sources of the faith. And I think this is legitimate. This is quite legitimate. A, a parallel can be seen in the reform movements of religious orders, right? Every religious order, Benedictines, Carmelites, Jesuits, Franciscans, Dominicans, over time, they, they get corrupt. They get decadent. This is just a fact. This is what happens with fallen human beings, right? We all, we tend to go downhill. So, you, you know, the Dominicans, the Franciscans, they start with this tremendous fervor and then they start to, and then they decline, right? But God raises up individual saints later on who say, okay, time to reform the Dominicans or time to reform the Franciscans, time to reform the Benedictines, right? And, and so something like the Cistercians are a reform movement of the Benedictines. And those reformers always, what do they always say? They say, let's go back to the sources of our religious order. Let's go back to our rule, our original rule, to the original people who lived it. Let's try to imitate them, right? So I think this kind of resource mod is entirely legitimate and, and healthy and good. The problem with antiquarianism is that it's a sort of arbitrary uh, leapfrogging over many centuries of, of the life of devotion and prayer and theology in the history of the church. It leapfrogs over those things and dismisses them in favor of some kind of putative, original, pure way of doing things. Uh, and, and so it's, it's, it's not like the other resource mod. It, it has a kind of contemptuous attitude towards what has been developed legitimately in between, right? And so people, people who do antiquarianism will say, well, um, in the early church, there's evidence that in some places they gave communion in the hand. And so, and so even though for, you know, over a thousand years, we haven't done communion in the hand, we're going to go back to that early custom because it must have been better. It's earlier, therefore it must have been better. And, and, there, and therefore dismissing the reasons for which communion in the hand was stopped in the first place, right? And it's communion in the hand stopped happening because of abuses and because people saw that there was a better way of doing it. So earlier is not necessarily better, right? And this is something Pius XII brings out really well in his encyclical Mediator Dei. He says, just because something was done earlier does not mean it was better because the Holy Spirit leads the church uh, into greater and greater maturity of faith and expression of faith. So in the liturgy, especially, antiquarianism is very, very dangerous. Um, because so much of what we love and, and benefit from in our liturgy is the result of development that happens in 5th or 7th or 10th or 12th century, right, after Christ. There, you know, the, the Holy Spirit is always working in the church and raising up new, you know, new ways of praising God. Let me just give you a, a tiny example of that, right? The Palm Sunday liturgy that we all love so much with the, 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 the procession with palms, and chanting Hosanna, and then hearing the Passion read, right? That is something that is a medieval development. That's not something that ancient Christians were doing, right? Um, but are we going to get rid of that because it's a medieval development? No, of course not, right? So the, the liturgical reformers, I'll just make one last point because there's so much that can be said about this. The, the liturgical reformers were very inconsistent in their antiquarianism, and that's what you always find. They, they went back to the early church and they picked up things that they liked that kind of chimed in with their modern ideas, usually in the form of simplification or abbreviation or something that was a little more, a little less developed, let's say less, um, you know, they, they want, they were looking for something which was simple and abbreviated. So they went back to early things, but anything they didn't like about the early Christian sources, like the emphasis on fasting and abstinence and penance, which is huge in the early church and much more than it was later on. Oh, they just quietly pass over that. They don't <laughs> want that. In fact, they go in the opposite direction. They abolish the fasting and the abstinence, even though that's the most ancient of all practices, right? So this is where antiquarianism completely self-destructs. <laughs> yeah, that's a, that's a good point. I, I hadn't really I thought of that, actually, the fact that uh, the early church was incredibly rigorous in its disciplines and the idea that it would if you what if a confessor suggested scourging yourself as a uh, as a penance oh my goodness there would be riots in the street uh, but no go ahead well let me let me just say i mean scourging you know like flagellation is more of a medieval penance but mm. um but an example would be this saint basil the great in one of his uh, writings he just matter of factly mentions as without any sense of of, this is extraordinary, that that a woman who's had an abortion and confesses it 
has to do 15 years of penance. Okay, 15 years of not receiving communion, uh, of which it's something like five years have to be spent outside the church begging for people's prayers, and then five years have to be spent you know, like in the foyer of the church and then five years in the nave of the church. And then finally she can be readmitted to communion. Wow. Okay. That, that's how seriously they took the crime of abortion. Right. I mean, what is our problem in modern times? You know, it's, it's, it, we have no sense of sin anymore mm. and of the gravity of sin. I mean, this is Pius the 12th said the greatest sin of the modern age is the forgetfulness of sin. Right? Wow. This is something he said in a radio address. Um, so, I mean, really, you know, I'm all in favor of a healthy resource mall, but it has to be sincere and authentic and and serious, you know, and that's not what we saw after Vatican II. Absolutely. Absolutely. And one other thing, you know, you mentioned several times that a lot of these <laughs> things are a it's a going like a a resource mall or a resourcement going back to the sources is more of a. Um, restoration of things that are good and not just like picking and choosing and you know it just kind of reminds me i've become over the last few years a great devotee to professor plinio correa de Oliveira and uh mr oreta's letters uh his his several articles talking about uh his thought and on this topic has really struck me as a you know that the, if the revolution is disorder then the counter-revolution has to be a return to order, which is Christian yes. civilization. And that yes. is such a wonderful articulation of that because we're not we're not trying to be revolutionaries. We're not trying to fight against the church. We, that's not the mentality of being a traditionalist. The mentality is being a yes. counter-revolutionary, is wanting to bring about a return to order. What are your thoughts exactly. on that? Exactly. No, I, I totally agree with that. And in fact... Um, you know, uh, Martin Mosebach puts it very well. He's an author I admire greatly, and he wrote the foreword to this book, for which I'm grateful. Um, he he said in, in once that reform means return to form. That's what reform mm. means. So reform doesn't mean loosening up, relaxing, giving up all kinds of things, right? That's what it tends to mean nowadays. But what it means is tightening the discipline, returning to things that have been forgotten and neglected, right? It, it kind of means ramping things up. That's what reform really means. Uh, in, you know, let's go back to what we have neglected. Um, and so uh, your point about counter-revolution, yes, what Catholic traditionalists are trying to do is not fight the church. We're trying to prevent people in the church from being suicidal, from from self-destructing right we're we're trying to prevent people from basically being like suicide bombers with respect to to catholicism right uh, and so we're actually like the we're like the uh law enforcement officers or the or the uh emergency responders who are saying no don't. if you do that you're going to blow up right this is not going to work at all so we're, we're actually just defending the the um the tradition in the proper sense of the word Absolutely, absolutely. I've been reading as I'm reading. I'd like to read multiple books at the same time. So I'm reading uh, the two timely issues that Mr. Odetta writes the forward to that the TFP yes. has put out, and it's excellent. And I want to get your thoughts on. Um, we're running out of time. Do you have time to stay a little bit longer? Uh, just just a, a little just while a little longer. Okay. Yes. Yeah. The the one thing that I want to get your take on around his book, I haven't finished it quite yet, but the idea of the of a hyper papalism as as you call it versus an ultramontanism as Mr. Oretta defends. Um, what are your thoughts on the the role of the papacy? I just did a a podcast not too long ago. Uh, talking about how we should have great love and devotion to the papacy, giving the example of Pius the Ninth, how he started off as a liberal, and John Bosco saying, uh, telling his boys, "Don't say Viva Pius the Ninth. Instead, say Viva the Pope, Viva the Papacy." Uh, so you have to have a love and devotion to the to the Pope and to the papacy, but not necessarily recognizing that the uh, the current occupant of the of the papacy is a saint. Sure. Well, I mean, the fact of the matter is that. In any Christian state of life, any vocation, any office that we could hold, um, there's there's a distinction between the office or the state or the vocation and the person who inhabits it. The person can be more or less worthy of that vocation or state or office, right? Um, and so when we pray for the Pope, as we're supposed to pray, we pray that he be delivered from his enemies. I mean, that implies that he might be attacked by enemies and that he might 
give in to enemies, right? So that, that is, it would, there would be no point in praying for the Pope if the Pope was just sort of fused with his office into a perfect unity that was separated only by death, you know, and uh, and he could never deviate, he could never do anything wrong, imprudent, uh, erroneous, or whatever. But that's not the Catholic teaching. The Catholic teaching is that God gives him certain graces of state, as he gives to all of us, graces of office, but that he is free to cooperate with those or not to cooperate with those. And a saintly pope is precisely one who does cooperate with God, and and, and a sinful pope or a mediocre pope uh, is one who doesn't, right? So I think the difference between Mr. Ureta and myself isn't really as big as it might seem on the surface. Um, I, I agree we should be definitely devoted to the papacy, the office of the pope, um, and that means being dedicated to, to the proper functioning of the office of the Pope. What is the office of the Pope for? What is he supposed to do? He is supposed to be above and beyond everyone else, the, the defender of tradition, of paradosis, of traditio. Right? He is supposed to be the one who most of all humbly receives and passes on like a shepherd feeding his flock all that has been given and defends it against the evil assaults of the enemy. Right. So that's that's what we see the great popes doing. And that's and if we have a pope like that, you know, I'm going to be the first one cheering him on. You know, I'm not anti papal in that sense, but I'm very much against the cult of a papal personality. I'm very much against the the idea of the superstar pope who just gets to redefine whatever he wishes about Catholicism. That's so antithetical to the successor of Peter, mm. you know, and to the vicar of Christ. He's not supposed to be some kind of, uh, you know, arbitrary monarch whose will is law, as Ratzinger once put it. Mm, right? Absolutely. So that's that's what I'm talking about. Really. Awesome. Thank you very much. And then I, just two last questions. One is I want to get I haven't finished your book yet. And your last chapter is on the, the your title. The Once and Future Roman Rite. So why is it that you titled it Once and Future Roman Rite? Obviously, immediately you're thinking of King Arthur, Once and Future King. Um, yes. but so why that that name? And then I have one last question for you after that. Sure. I mean, I mean, it's just the idea of the title came to me just because it seemed like a really nice way of saying that the Roman Rite, as it has existed in its unitary organic development over a period of over 1600 years, that this once upon a time Roman Rite that was basically uh, that, that an attempt was made to dismiss and and bury in the 1960s um, has not died contrary to you know the predictions uh, and it, it's in fact reflourishing albeit under many challenges and that it will be our future Roman right that is all the young educated people I know, and I, I, I'm in touch with people from all over the world and all the all the seminarians and clergy I've met under a certain age, they are either traditionalist in their mentality or they are sympathetic or they're moving in that direction. So I think what was the Roman right will in fact be the Roman right again in mm -hmm. the future. That's the once and future part. Um, the other point just briefly is that that last chapter is about the pre-55 um, condition of the Roman right. And I make the argument there, it's the longest chapter, um, but it, because it, it needs the attention, uh, the subject needs the attention, deserves the attention, but it's an argument that we, that the Roman rite in its fullness is what you find in its Tridentine form, which is what, which was what was passed down all the way until the middle of the 20th century. Uh, and then there are, there begin to be these inexplicable, um, severe modifications made to the Tridentine Rite, as we could call it, or the Roman Rite, uh, under Pius XII, uh, that paved the way for what Paul VI did. And I, I make, I think, a pretty good case there uh, that we should return to the fullness of the Roman Rite, uh, which is to say it's pre-55 form. Uh, and this is not some kind of, some people say, oh, well, then where do you ever stop? What's your date? No, it's not about that. It's just, I'm just making the point that what you see in 1570 is a kind of pinnacle of everything up until that point. And from 1570 to the, the 20th century, you have quite a bit of stability. That's a period of great stability. I make the argument in the book, especially chapter two, that that's a positive feature, that it, it didn't change because it didn't need to change, not because it was frozen and ossified and, you know, people talk about these silly things. Um, and that, you know, the, the radical changes that began to be made to it are are really corruptions of that that liturgical form. 
so that's that's my argument. I, I give it in, in chapter twelve. Amen, amen. That was that was really good. And especially, I I actually attended the pre fifty five liturgy Holy Week this last year. I drove out from Houston to Louisiana to go to the Institute of Christ the King there, and. I was blown away. I was absolutely, yes. I was flabbergasted. I ended up afterwards ended up purchasing the the book on the pre-55 liturgy. And I was just, I was just <laughs> absolutely stunned by everything. And I, I'm going to make sure that I, I go in the future to try to learn more about it. It's just so, yes. it's so profound. But uh, I want to, before I ask you my last question, uh, the people who are watching the once in future Roman Rite, I cannot recommend it enough. I'm not even done with it, but everything we've talked about has been barely scratching the surface of like small sections of chapters. So I cannot recommend it enough. It's a must read for anyone who wants to know, know more about the traditional liturgy and, or even for those who are who are kind of skeptical of the traditional liturgy and just want to explore the idea, I, I cannot recommend a better one-stop shop. I can recommend you 10, 20 other books, but this is the best book that I found that kind of covers everything all in one place. Um, so I cannot recommend it enough. And so the last question I have for you is I kind of want your response to this um, critique. And so I have a very good friend, I won't mention his name, but he uh, put out this and tagged me in it, um, knowing that I go to the Trish for Mass. He was my uh, campus minister when I was in high school, so I've known him for a, a very long time, and we be, have a great relationship, so I have no disrespect. But um, he put out this, this kind of message against, uh, not against, but a critique of traditional Catholics. And I want to see what your, how you would respond. He said... For lessons for millennials and Gen Z, Catholic Traditional Latin Mass Special Edition. I love that so many of you young Catholics have found Jesus through the traditional Latin Mass, but it's okay that the TLM is not my way of connecting with Jesus and worshiping him. I like to be able to hear and understand and pray in the only language I sort of have mastery in. This does not make me ignorant or nor a lesser Catholic, nor someone who is opposed to how you like to worship. I'm excited for you, and I'm also perfectly content with a very well-said Novus Ordo Mass. And I like that the readings are in the same ones I can find in my <coughs> Magnificat prayer books. Don't try to convert me, and don't question the Catholic stripes of those of us who grew up with the St. John Paul II and the Novus Ordo Mass. If you do try too hard to convince others of your worship superiority, it strikes of Gnosticism, not trying to shut you down as some bishops seem to be hell-bent on doing, but I do sort of understand where their caution comes from, though. I don't agree with shutting the mass down at all, and I would defend your right as Catholics to go to the TLM. Out. Uh, so how would you respond to that in, uh, in charity, mm -hmm. um, the, this kind of critique of traditional Catholics? Sure. Well, I mean, look, I understand. I, I, I always remind people that I grew up in a liberal Novus Ordo parish. I was in the charismatic movement. Um, I even wrote a guitar song. You know, I, uh, I I I provided music for the Novus Ordo for twenty years. You know, I know I know that whole realm in its best and worst manifestations, and I don't judge anybody who whose only experience of the liturgy has been that. I think that when you discover the traditional liturgy and when you let it shape you and form your mind and heart you discover such a depth, such a wealth, that it makes you excited about it. It makes you want to share it. It makes you want to bring in other fellow Catholics and say, look at what you've been missing. Like, I, I mean, I was missing it in my life. And when I discovered it, I realized how much I was missing. You don't realize what you're missing if you don't know it, right? Um, and so I think that we just, we need to respond to something like that by saying, you know, listen, brother, I, you know, I understand what you're saying. I'm not judging you. I'm not saying that your mass is invalid or anything or that you don't or that it hasn't even improved you. I'm not saying that. What I what I am saying is that something drastically wrong happened in the 1960s when the church so severely cut back centuries and centuries of her traditions and of the of the prayer, the treasury of prayer that we had as Catholics and that, and that we need to recover this, and it will be to your benefit and the benefit of the entire mystical body of Christ if we recover these things, right? Let me try to persuade you. Let Come with me, right? Give it, give it a chance. Um, give it some time, not just one time. That's not enough. Um, but just one, so that's what I would say. Um, one last point, though, is, you know, we have aids for the traditional Latin mass. We have something called Benedictus. I don't have a copy with me. It's over there. I'm not going to get up and, and play. But there's something called Benedictus, which is the equivalent of Magnificat for the Latin mass. And it's got, it, it comes out monthly in the mail, just like Magnificat. And uh, it has all the, the readings and antiphons and prayers of the mass in English, very easily laid out, very easy to use. Um, tons of people, I mean, I've heard that 
well over 10,000 people are subscribing to Benedictus right now. It's a, it's a great tool. So there's no, there doesn't need to be even a barrier of understanding, but the mass is about so much more than just our rational comprehension, right? Amen. Amen. Thank you very much. Dr. Peter Kwasniewski has been our guest, and his book is The Once in Future Roman Rite, uh, published by Tan and Tan Books. It was an excellent read. I cannot recommend it enough. And just think about today. Think about today. What is the Mass for? Think about today. Is the Mass for me or is the Mass for God? And if it's for God, should we give him our best or should we just give him what we have? Let's give him our best. Let's let's muster up everything we can today and give God what he is due. And he is due all of it because he created you, he loves you, and he desires your salvation. So the least we can do is make a little couple sacrifices, make some things that are maybe difficult to us and offer up those difficulties to give God the greatest glory. God bless you. God love you. And we'll see you uh, in the next episode.